Yep, 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 I'm coming, I'm coming. Last round. That's me, test riding an e-bike. I want to go super fast again. Turbo mode on. This bike has a very special feature. This is so much fun. It communicates with other vehicles on the road. Let's hear all about it. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. Hey, it's Jeff. And Melena. Talking to you from our home studios. But let's put us in a different place. Can we have some background ambiance, please, Sylvan? My God, that immediately increases my stress level. Right? Melina, how do you picture yourself in this scene? <laughs> I can tell you, because I had that a couple of times in the past now. Imagine me on a bike, trying to navigate this chaotic city street. But it's not just me. I also have a toddler, my son, in the back seat. This lovely little kid has just learned how to take off his bike helmet, which is a fantastic skill. <laughs> And he tells me from back there, Mommy, I'm gonna throw it! Which is great. So I have to stop that from happening while also trying to keep my eyes on the road and not get hit by a car. <laughs> you see? There's my stress level. All in the day of a life of a mom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But I mean, if this street was in your city, would you also be on a bike? Uh, honestly, I'm more of a car person. Uh, But that doesn't mean it's less stressful necessarily. Mm. Cars, trucks, pedestrians, construction sites. Mm -hmm. And there's more and more bikes on the road, as you noticed, which, which is a good thing. There are so many factors to watch out for. So trying to keep on top of what's happening around my car can be a lot as well. True. And, of course, there's distractions in the car as well. You're not using your phone while driving, are you? Uh, in the American way of saying this, I will plead the fifth. Uh, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I'd like to think that I'm a responsible driver. At least my insurance rates would say that I'm a responsible driver. But I can't say that I'm never distracted. In any case, in, in your car, you're, of course, much less vulnerable than me mm -hmm. on my bike. Yep. And maybe it's because I have a little passenger on my bike nowadays, but I really feel like traffic has become more tense where I live. What's it like in Chicago? Well, I can tell you exactly what it's like. Uh, not based on how it feels, but based on the numbers. Mm -hmm. The city of Chicago puts all crash statistics on the web, and you can actually play around with the data. So let me tell you what you want to know. Oh, that's interesting. Um, give me the number of crashes. Is it going up or down? All right, let's see. Uh, so last year in 2022, the Chicago police registered uh, quite a number of crashes, uh, 108,000. 108,000 in Chicago alone? Yes, um, but actually that's down compared to the pre-pandemic phase. In 2019, we had 118,000 crashes. Okay, wow. And uh, to get a little more precise now, what about crashes involving bikes? That is also down by quite a lot, actually. Really? It gives me the number of people involved in crashes with bikes. 2019 was 264,000 people. And three years later, in 2022, it's 234,000 people. So a reduction of 30,000 people, which is you know, something like 2%. Even though more bikes are on the road now, I'm sure. And do you know why the numbers are down? Nope. I think something called Vision Zero plays a role in that. Ah, uh, wait a sec. Vision Zero. I think I've heard of that before. The idea comes from Sweden. It's simply the goal to eliminate all traffic fatalities. To make that happen, the Vision Zero approach is to consider traffic deaths not as inevitable, but as preventable. And it takes into account that humans will never be perfect. So factor in human failing when thinking about road safety. With Vision Zero, road safety is viewed as a public health issue. And that's what the city of Chicago is doing, among many other cities. 
It starts with building safer bike infrastructure and doesn't end with creating awareness and lowering speed limits. Ah, you know where I heard about Vision Zero? At the office, of course, at Bosch. The company Bosch is also since many years dedicated to this topic. I think we all work hard every day and night to avoid any accident on our roads. That's Christian Cosens from Bosch e-bike systems. Okay, Bosch e-bike systems. They build drive units and displays and batteries and everything that makes a great, fully connected e-bike system. And digital solutions too. But how can they necessarily change anything about crashes and road fatalities? Christian is happy to tell you. We are very proud of the e-bike ABS, the first series ready ABS for e-bikes. So this is where the cyclist gets more control over his e-bike. And this is also contributing a lot to safe cycling. Anti-lock brake system on a bike. That's pretty cool. Very cool. Because this addresses a huge number of accidents already. Giving cyclists more control over the bike can make a big impact there. Well, hopefully avoid a big impact, if you know what I mean. (laughs) Fair. (laughs) (laughs) But there are still many accident scenarios that can't be solved by ABS. And those actually might be the more dangerous ones. The ones where serious injuries and even fatalities can happen. Christian and his team started by looking at accident statistics. But, well, I'll let him tell the story. It started actually with a safety strategy, with a safety paper, with an investigation where we looked into accident statistics, but where we also uh, did a user survey and tried to get some kind of a feeling why cyclists or why people who are not cycling are not cycling because they, f- they feel unsafe. So what is it? Why they feel unsafe? And this is what we wanted also to, to understand. What did they find? Regarding the accident statistics, when you map crashes, you can see that there are some hotspots. That's similar in any city, probably. You can address that by smarter infrastructure. But there are also a lot of crashes happening all over the place. We definitely see the necessity to address also the other places where accidents are happening, where we don't have intelligent infrastructure. So that's why we strongly believe that connected bicycles can play a major role in making cycling safer. Connected bicycles, of course. I recently went to meet Christian and some of his colleagues in Kusterding on the outskirts of Stuttgart, where they showed me a prototype of such a connected bicycle. So... Time for a test run. Us. What do you want me to do? Give it all. So we're here today at Bosch e-bike systems to test a very cool new safety feature for e-bikes. Well, bikes in general, I have to say, and cars. And I'm, I'm super excited because I'll get the opportunity to, to really test it, test it live, be on the bike, be in the car, and yeah, really see and experience uh, what, what that feature does. That feature? It's called V2X, right? Correct. Vehicle to anything communication. When we specifically talk about a bicycle being connected with cars and infrastructure, we are calling it also V2X, so bike to anything communication. We'll explain it a little more later, but first, let's experience it, because that really blew me away. First, I took the car driver's perspective. That's my perspective, basically. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll do the in-car experience first. Getting into the car, I'm in the back seat. We have Christian right in front of me. Yes. <laughs> um, we're in a parking lot, which is in general like a tricky situation for everyone in, in traffic, right? Because it's kind of hard to have an overview over what's going on. Oh, and we do have fantastic weather conditions, mm. right? That makes it even harder for a car driver. <laughs> <laughs> to see anything. It's raining rather heavily at the moment. Oh, yeah. I'm it's... glad that we're uh, in the car, not on the bike right now. <laughs> okay, okay. So we're starting. The car is starting. We're moving forward. So the first use case will be the lane departure assist. Yeah? So we are just imagine we are standing along the road and we are parking and we are just hopping on the car and we want to leave. It's raining, we have to make a move, yeah? we, we are busy. 
So the car is currently blinking. Mm -hmm. And the bicycle is coming from behind. Okay. And you see, did you see the icon and the tone? The that was it already, yeah. Yeah, this was it already. Of course, we did not see the icon. So what happened here? So as the car was backing out of the parking spot, the beep was alerting the driver that there was a bike on a collision course. And a little icon showed up on the dashboard at the same time. So you couldn't see the bike. Uh, I mean, the, the driver, in this case, could not see the bike. But the car somehow could. Somehow. How does it work exactly? Is it sensors? Is it, is it cameras? Is yeah. it both? This is what nowadays all the cars have, these cameras and yeah. la, uh, radars and, and uh, ultrasonic sensors. Here we are, we are having a complete different technology. This is based on connectivity. So cars can talk to bikes and bikes can talk to cars mm -hmm. directly. So there is a, a communication between the bike and the car. And based on that, the car knows where the bicycle is exactly. So oh. th there is a bike coming from left Helpful. and the HMI tells, watch out, there is a bicycle yeah. coming yeah, to create awareness. That sounds pretty cool. And uh, Christian said HMI there, and that means human machine interface. And if I got it right, the other sensors that are active when you're reversing, they don't actually help you here. The camera, the distance sensors, they only detect objects that are already behind the car. A bike that's approaching quickly from the side may still be far away when I put the car in reverse. But with this V2X communication, the bike tells the car, watch out, I'm coming your way. Spot on. It is up to 500 meters where the communication already starts. 500? 500 meters where the communication already starts. So the car starts to communicate with the bike, receive information, from and, the, and it is assessing. Of, yeah. assessing. Or certainly, the, everything can happen in that distance. Yeah. Yeah? So it's, it's under observation, but no action taken yet. So only when it really comes close and it becomes a danger, then the system starts to alert and to create awareness. Okay, wow. The car algorithm is calculating, based on own information, a collision potential. Then it comes up with a warning concept. Okay. And we can imagine that later on, when this solution is even more robust, that the system is also maybe even breaking, or like in the lane departure use case, is not allowing the driver to move. And yeah, it's already impressive how connectivity can improve the visibility of, uh, of bikes. Uh, wait a second. I'm pretty sure we heard a wow there. Can we have the jingle, please? Wow. Wait until you hear how it works. So as you heard, the bike and the car are talking to each other. They are connected and they are exchanging information. Information like I'm a bicycle or I'm a car. I'm at this location currently. I'm driving with that speed in that direction. And let's say as a system on, a, on the bicycle, we are now receiving that information from all the vehicles around the bicycle. Then we can build up a map which is carrying all the different data points from the vehicles around me. <laughs> you can see this as dots on a map around myself, around my own position, with some arrows attached to these dots indicating the direction of travel. And the length of this arrow may be indicating the speed of travel. Of course, this is just to illustrate what's happening inside the system. That map is not actually displayed on the e-bike screen. That will be super confusing, I think. And now there might be the situation that these two arrows, so my own one and the arrow of a vehicle nearby, might cross each other. So this might indicate a potential collision. <laughs> okay, uh, now I want this. I'm going to need to get V2X in my car. Maybe you already have it. Some car makers integrate it already. Bike makers, not so much. So right now, some cars can communicate with some other cars that are outside of their field of view and perhaps avoid some car-on-car -car collisions. But there's a lot more potential. Well, you know, I listened to the previous episode that you and Shuka hosted, and you talked about something similar, the, the chicken and egg problem. <laughs> this technology is only making sense if 
almost everybody is using it or some kind of critical mass of use is coming. But almost no one builds it into their product so far. That's exactly the problem here. How to get manufacturers of vehicles of all kinds to adapt V2X. And this includes really everything. Cars, bikes, scooters, trucks, buses. Only if every vehicle is connected, the single participants within the transportation system will benefit. So you mentioned Vision Zero earlier. That could actually be a driving force behind adoption. There is an increased urgency to reduce traffic deaths. And Jeff, Christian particularly points to the situation in the US, where you live. We see, and this is really unfortunate, that in USA the number of fatalities are increasing since two years in the row. This is an unfortunate fact. And if I go back to my statistics here from Chicago, I can actually see the same thing. I said earlier that the number of crashes is down, but the number of fatalities actually goes up. This is terrible and not looking good for Vision Zero. This is an alarming situation in the US American market. And the US Department of Transportation is calling for action. This is never happened in history with this strong intent uh, to really change the situation and to counter strike this development. The US Department of Transportation issued a call for action to push the industry to launch the V2X technology in order to, to unlock the promise V2X always gave to the society. So V2X always promised to bring safety to the mobility system. And this is where they now ask the industry, hey, you always promise this, now it's time to deploy. You see, the technology has been around for a while. It's been in development for a number of years now, actually. So it's ripe for development on the road, in the vehicles. We as Bosch e-bike systems want to make sure that in that momentum, bicyclists and bicycles as such are not forgotten. We believe that bicycles need to be part of the V2X ecosystem and hence need to be part in the deployment push in the North American market. It's starting to sound like I might see this in the real world earlier than you over there in Europe, Milena. We'll see how that plays out. Of course, European players also see the relevance of this technology. At least I got to try it first during the demo in the parking lot. And there's more from that because we haven't really talked about the perspective of the cyclist. Looking forward to hearing more about that. But you know what? Direct communication between bikes and cars is actually nothing new, even from a distance and even overcoming obstacles blocking the view. Do you remember this sound from the beginning of the episode? You could hear the communication right there. That's true, but also not the most reliable. But avoiding collisions just by ear can work. Let's diverge from the world of technology for a moment as we like to do here at From Know How to Wow, and have a look at nature. Holger Görlitz studies bats at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Intelligence. And he speaks bat. <laughs> uh, not really. What we can do, like if you just make a funny uh, sound with your lips, like <laughs> these kind of sounds, <laughs> that contains a lot of ultrasound and to some extent sounds a little bit like the rustling noises that an insect would make when it's walking around on the floor. And for some bats, it's really attractive. Famously, bats use ultrasound for navigation. So really high-pitched sounds that the human ear can't hear. Mm, it's called echolocation, right? Mm -hmm. They listen to the reflections of their calls, and that helps them orientate themselves. Is that right? That's right. But that's not all. They also do have communication calls by which they talk to each other, as we do. So mother, pup, males and females, and so on. How is this relevant to V2X or to B2X communication? Well, bat-to-bat -bat communication also uses inaudible signals that carry a lot of information. Inaudible to us, at least. In the simplest case, they convey information. I am here, and I am moving in this direction. And we do know that bats listen to the calls of other individuals. If one 
that, for example, is very successful in hunting and emitting its typical hunting sequences, this will attract other bats. Or vice versa, if there are too many bats at a given foraging spot, other bats will fly away because it's just too crowded. <laughs> so they know how many bats are there and what they're doing. Fantastic. That is indeed kind of similar to B to X communication. Well, it is B to X communication. It's it's bat to anything communication. <laughs> That's a second dad joke. <laughs> uh, come on, that was a good today. one. <laughs> No, but you know, during my demo in the parking lot, it was just one car and one bike communicating with each other. But in a real world scenario, all the vehicles within a certain radius would communicate with everyone else. And I don't think we've mentioned that. Each participant sends out a new signal 10 times per second. Hey, that's the same for the bats. Chuk, chuk, chuk. And they go like this. About 10 calls a second. <laughs> Each call just 10 milliseconds long. So it's in sweeping down from higher frequencies uh, to lower frequencies. Chick, 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 like this. And if they fly closer to an object, that could be a wall during landing, but also when catching an insect, they will make those calls even shorter and many more, like up to 200 calls per second. Chick, sounds like this at the end to us. That's true for most of the more than 1,400 different bat species. Some use other strategies. So how well does that work in a crowded environment where there are a lot of individuals all sending out their signals at the same time? Holger says their collision warning is not perfect. Yes, they do collide, also depending a lot on the context. So you might have seen those typically emergences where hundreds, thousands, millions of bats emerge from caves and they're all flying together. So we do see collisions there which don't really hurt them because they're flexible enough, right? But it must be extremely challenging to echolocate in these kind of conditions. And they do echolocate there, so they call. We don't really know how much they can perceive and what kind of information they do get in this situation. So probably their spatial memory will help. The fact that they all fly into the same direction just prevents collisions because they're not flying against each other. But we also do have recordings of, say, around 10 bats flying in circles in a cave, which is also a very complicated situation because all the cave walls are reflecting echoes and there are still not many collisions. I'm about to become a real bad fan here. That's very impressive. Maybe to steer us back into nerdy techie territory though, how does Holger get those recordings? How does he research bats? I'm not going to let you off the hook for the bat fan comment that you, you know what you're doing to me right there. It's cruel. But back to Holger. Both in the lab and in the wild, he collaborates with scientists from Israel and Denmark who have developed little bat backpack full of technology. They have tiny computers that we can put on the back of bats with microphones, with GPS, with accelerometers, magnetometers. And we can really fly with a wild animal and for the whole night, record its behavior. If it's flying up, down, how fast it's flying, we get each echolocation calls and we even hear the echoes that are coming back. And based on this, we get fascinating insights. We hear calls and echoes, but also the extraneous sound. So we hear, for example, if a cricket is singing and we have then data seeing that the bat is homing in on those song of the cricket then we see in the accelerometer that it's landing. We hear the chewing sounds when it's when the catch was successful. So it's fascinating what kind of insights we get there. Thanks, Holger, for telling us about this fascinating research and for the bat sounds we've been hearing. They were slowed down so that it's actually audible to our human ears. By the way... It's a good thing that normally bat sounds are inaudible. Uh, so we're lucky that we can't hear them. They're about the intensity of a jackhammer. 140 decibels Whoa. sound pressure level about 10 centimeters from the mouth. Nope. Thank you. Let's stick to electromagnetic waves for VTEX. That sounds like a good idea to me. Time for me to switch perspectives and see what V2X looks like from a cyclist perspective. Oh, it's a cargo bike! I love that! 
cool. Good choice, guys. Oh my God, I was so freaking excited about this. I've never rode electrified cargo bike before. And this one was so cool because it had a rack in the front and in the back, which allows for so much stuff to be transported by bike. I could easily have my kid in the back and groceries in the front, for example. And basically, it's as easy to ride as a regular bike, a regular e-bike. <laughs> God, you see, I'm freaking excited about this. Still, <laughs> I took it for a spin. Loved it. Let's try turbo mode. Turbo mode. How fast? <laughs> How fast can I go? Ah. <laughs> oh, there are cars approaching from the right. So as I mentioned, we're in a parking lot, which I think really makes it difficult to... Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. To really fully see what's going on everywhere. I'll turn right again. Car is also to my right. Blocked by another car. And here it is. I'll get a beeping sound on the bike. Telling me that there is a car which could become a danger. That's so cool. <laughs> uh, Milena, I have to say, it <laughs> sounds like you really enjoyed your field trip. I had the very best time, although it was raining so hard and so badly. <laughs> but I didn't care at all. I just, I really enjoyed riding that bike. Did you enjoy it because it was a cargo bike or because of the B2X technology? And be honest. <laughs> got me there. <laughs> I really <laughs> fell in love with that cargo bike. I could already picture my toddler in it. But the warnings about cars that I got were really, really impressive too. I hope you guys could also hear that. <laughs> so we're going to have the test car now in the, in the next use case. In the back. I'll have it in my back. So I won't be able to really see it. It's approaching, and here we have it, again. Bike warned me that there's a car approaching on the back. <laughs> that is really fantastic, I love that. Oh, car on the left. It, honestly, Melina, seriously, I, I can see uh, how that can make you actually feel significantly safer on a bike. Right? That's something Christian said in the beginning. They studied what makes people feel unsafe, and they found that those are not necessarily the same situations that are actually the most dangerous. But taking away that feeling of not being safe is just as important as alleviating dangers. Before we go, I'd like to talk about one more technical issue. We said that V2X has been around for years and stems from cars. Mm -hmm. It was actually designed for autonomous cars, so that they could communicate with each other. But it can be just plugged into onto a bike and it just works. Oh, Jeff, please. Of course not. You need some smart engineers. <laughs> As always. <laughs> As always. Certainly there are some special challenges to be mastered on a bicycle. Yeah, we have different dynamic patterns uh, on a bicycle, which we don't have in cars, for instance. Uh, the car is driving quite steadily in one direction, whereas the bicycle is due to the pedaling, um, is, is swerving to a certain extent. And this is what the system, the V2X system, needs to acknowledge and needs to, to filter out in order not to constantly send out different uh, direction of travel to the ro other road participants. So certain technology and certain logic needs to be put in place in order to handle that filtering. More on that in the next episode. And that'll be the deep dive that's hosted by my voice avatar, where we really go into the nitty gritty of how things work. So if you want to hear more about how B2X technology has become ready for market, thanks to our engineer colleagues, watch out for the deep dive. I think it's great that after decades and decades of new safety systems in cars, some really smart safety technology now also becomes available for bikes. It's much better than a reflective vest, isn't it? <laughs> in addition to attempting to be visually recognized by other participants in traffic, you're announcing yourself digitally you become digitally visible. Safety first. 
Yep. I'm going to go check if my car has V2X or not. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye, Jeff. Bye, listeners. And if you don't mind, tell a friend or two about this podcast, would you? Thanks. Bye, guys. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. Love what you're doing. Isn't it great? Can you believe that? The car sees. I'm such a fan. So from here to that building over there, the car and the bike are actually talking. That is insane. But the